Hospitals and health systems are using alternative methods to reach their patients. Through the use of telehealth visits, hospitals are finding they can still deliver quality behavioral health patient care. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast from the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly, Senior Writer for AHA. In this podcast, Rebecca Chickey, Senior Director of Field Engagement, Behavioral Health Services within the AHA, is speaking with Martha Whitecotton, Senior Vice President of Behavioral Health Services at Adrian Health in Charlotte, North Carolina. They're talking about using telehealth visits to provide behavioral health care to patients during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Rebecca Chickey, and I'm the Senior Director of Field Engagement of Behavioral Health Services at the American Hospital Association. And today I'm joined by Martha Whitecotton, the Senior Vice President of Behavioral Health Services at Atrium Health. Martha, welcome to today's podcast, and thank you so much for taking the time to share your experience, your expertise, and your wisdom. Um, Can you first tell us a little bit about your role at Atrium Health? and the overarching goal of Atrium's Behavioral Health Care Service Line. Yes, Rebecca, thank you all for having me today. So my, you introduced my title, and it just described that I'm responsible for the Behavioral Health Service Line, which at Atrium Health is really a true service line. We have everything that is behavioral health, including our providers, all report to me and to a senior medical director. And when we developed the service line at Atrium Health, which was in about 2012, the overarching goal was really to have this vision of value and population health. So developing a service line with an eye to population health. And our charge at that time was to really transform care delivery models. And in order to drive access and improve our patients' experience of care, as well as to clinically integrate behavioral health across the entire healthcare system, not to operate in a silo, but to really become integrated across every service line and every point that patients access our healthcare system. So you have a fully comprehensive integrated behavioral healthcare system, and then COVID happens. So can you share with the audience how COVID has impacted your health system's ability to provide behavioral health care? Well, obviously, behavioral health services are, you know, it's, I always talk about it as it's a, a service that's very dependent on humans. It's a human interaction where our, where our magic happens. And so we have this huge number of services that were largely dependent on face-to-face interactions with our patients. And as you know, when the pandemic hit and the early, you know, prognostications back in March, we didn't know what the future was going to be like in the next 30 days, much less the next 90 days. And so we really had to think quickly about how to pivot away from face-to-face care with the goal of making sure that we did not lose any patients in that in that transition. You know, there were primary care practices who could defer your physical for three months, but we couldn't defer a psychiatric evaluation or a psych follow-up visit. Our patients would um, suffer harm from that. So we had to make sure that we kept our services moving. So on the inpatient units, the, the biggest impact to our inpatient units was really how to deliver care to patients who may come into that environment in a congregate care setting and um, be positive for COVID or potentially be a person under investigation who needs to be tested? How do we isolate those patients? How do we handle a day room that is a group setting? How do we keep our patients and our staff safe? Um, You know, lots of changes in work has been done around that, and I think um, pretty much every inpatient behavioral health setting in the country has dealt with those issues. Um, In our outpatient services, obviously, that's where we had the most opportunity to transition to virtual care. And so we really looked across every place we deliver outpatient services, not just our freestanding psychiatric practices or our medication services, but also, also our intensive outpatient services, our partial hospitalization programs, our ACT teams, all of those services had to make quick and rapid transitions to incorporate a virtual platform. In our emergency department, 
We saw a significant decline in visit volume early on in the pandemic as our patients, our patients are pretty good at isolating anyway, but when they got scared, um, just like every other patient did, we saw ED volumes across the country decline initially. Um, we saw that same impact, but again, we were trying to adapt to that environment who has where we have a high number of psych holds um, to care for patients in a communal setting in a safe way. One of the one of the big wins in our ED environment has been our application of zero suicide principles. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But that's really been the, um, it was more about, we, instead of saying that we were no longer able to deliver care, it was how are we going to deliver care differently, but the same kind of care, the same level of care, the same amount of care. So Martha, for those who may not um, understand what a virtual platform is, I'm assuming you mean telehealth visits to deliver behavioral health care. Could you give us um, maybe a little practical application? Is that the virtual platform that you used? Um, and um, how does that work? Yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to do that, Rebecca. The um, You know, Atrium Health, as you know, Rebecca, has a very strong history and a lot of experience in de developing, ser in delivering services. Let me say that over again. Atrium Health has a strong history and a lot of experience and expertise in using a virtual care platform to deliver care to patients with mental illness. We have a 24-7 call center that operates with licensed professional staff delivering crisis care and navigation services. We have a very large telepsychiatry program. We do over 12,000 telepsych interventions per year into our emergency departments. We have virtual integration into primary care where we do primary care integration on a virtual care platform. We do patient navigation following high-risk ED visits. We do that on a virtual care platform. And we've done a little bit of a very small step in a rural community of doing some virtual video visits for psych evaluations and follow-ups. Our, so our biggest transformation here occurred, as I said before, in our outpatient services. And literally within about 14 days, we transitioned our entire ambulatory practices to virtual care. So we, first we had to outfit our, our physicians with the appropriate equipment. Many of them were operating with microphones or didn't have cameras, so we had to get the right equipment in place. We had to quickly across our, as our whole entire health system was trying to make these transitions, adopt multiple platforms. So we used Microsoft Teams, some of our um, practices in the healthcare system used doxy.com, and, and some of them were already on American Well. Um, for us in behavioral health, we've quickly adapted um, to Microsoft Teams. Uh, we will be transitioning to an Epic platform eventually, but for a quick overnight transition, Microsoft Teams worked. And we transitioned not only to video virtual visits, but telephonic e-visits because telephonic e-visits were something we could do really quickly. And, and I always say when I talk about virtual care that the telephone is virtual care just as much as a video visit is. So initially we did a lot of telephonic visits. And then we've now gotten to, the, to a place where we're, we've cut that down to about probably less than 30% of our visits are telephonic. A whole, now we have a very large number of video virtual visits. And then we're still doing some face-to-face -face visits for patients who you know, can't adapt to the um, technology needs for a virtual visit and need to be seen face-to-face. -face. And then across our intensive outpatient programs, our ACT team and our partial hospitalization, we enabled a virtual group. And so we have patients that are members of our partial hospitalization program, but they participate from their home virtually all day with the group work that's done in partial care. So that's just a quick um, description. Um, another interesting thing that happened in our healthcare system is that we quickly stood up what we called a virtual hospital. So if a patient tested positive for COVID-19, we admitted them to our virtual hospital and we worked very hard to keep patients from having to come to the actual hospital. So we've um, routinely managed about 2,000 patients on at any given time in the virtual hospital. They have two levels of care. In one level of care is um, nursing and physician support for the patient while they're going through the illness at home. The second level of care actually involves community paramedicine who can go to the patient's home and do um, oxygen therapy, IV therapy, um, 
do assessments, that kind of thing, to hopefully keep the patient from having to go to the hospital. But we quickly realized that within that population who is extremely isolated, who is fearful of their illness, that there was a high degree of anxiety. So we were able to quickly adapt our virtual primary care integration program into the virtual hospital for COVID, and now patients can be referred to our team for behavioral health support while they're being cared for in the virtual hospital for COVID-19. In our ED, um, we had already started a lot of um, work around zero suicide, and that's a really telephonic follow-up to those patients when they're discharged from the emergency room. And we've ramped that up to add high-risk discharges from the inpatient units, as well as really uh, adopting the concept of what they call caring cards. Uh, through the zero suicide work, following up with notes that are sent to patients' homes to remind them we're thinking about them and we care about them and we care if they get their follow-up care. Um, well, for teammates and provide, I think you also have to talk about in this sort of virtual care delivery conversation, what are we also doing for not only our patients, but for our teammates and for our physicians and our APPs who are in the thick of this every day, not only the, very, the normal stress that anyone is bearing in our communities around the pandemic, but also having to come to work every day, potential exposure, the added um, stress of the number of changes they've endured, the PPE requirements. And so, you know, as, as I said, we already had our 24-7 call center. We have a dedicated line for providers and APPs to use, which is anonymous. We also have our employee assistance program. We transitioned that to 100% virtual work, telephonic and video visits. And we also lifted the cap so patients have an un I mean, teammates and providers have an unlimited access to EAP during the pandemic response. And then we added um, one more um, piece of work to that, which is called the PATH program, which is physician, APP, and teammate health. And we have um, set up virtual psychotherapy and psychiatry visits specifically for teammates and physicians and APPs. And those are virtual visits and they are free of charge. And so we have seen about 53 unique patients in our PATH program, um, well over 100 visits to that program, primarily in psychiatry. But it clearly demonstrates that our providers are under stress as well as our patients. Martha, that is a wealth of information. Thank you for really making it come alive on the podcast. Um, I want to say I'm also glad that you mentioned the overall approach of Atrium Health in terms of the virtual hospital. Um, and to let people who are listening to this podcast know that there is a complimentary podcast um, that's available to you as a, an AHA member um, that is focused on and really drills down onto the um, virtual hospital um, uh, aspect. Secondly, Martha, I wanted to really appreciate um, and enforce the work that you're doing for your own clinical and staff colleagues, because those that are on the front lines or not, those individuals who are working um, in this incredibly stressful environment need to be supported, and all of the services that you described are exceptional. Um, AHA has done our, uh, uh, our own contribution to this. Um, anyone listening can go to aha.org forward slash behavioral health, and uh, you'll see a, a carousel going across the top. Um, and there you can click on the Stress and Coping Resources um, webpage that provides resources not only for healthcare providers and specifically behavioral healthcare providers, but for the general public. Um, as you know, Martha, uh, experts are saying we are going to see the implications and the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health and mental well-being of our staff and of our um, families and friends um, for, unfortunately, probably um, years to come. So glad to know you're delivering those resources to yours um, and, and really trying to stay ahead of the curve of the impact. Another couple of questions for you, and I'm going to frame them together. Um, it sounds like because of Atrium's um, innovative work 
um, with virtual platforms prior to COVID-19, that you have already launched a lot of this work, not all of it certainly, but a lot of this work with your physicians. And so I'm wondering um, what their reaction has been, your physicians, your clinicians, because I know in behavioral health, it's not just physicians, it's social workers, it's psychologists, it's psychiatric nurses, nurse practitioners. What's been their reaction to this um, accelerated use of the virtual platform? And um, complementary to that question, what's been the patient's reaction? You know, it's interesting, Rebecca, that even though we have this high degree of expertise and volume in virtual care, we had a camp of physicians and APPs who didn't do it and didn't want to do it. But it's been very interesting that a pandemic and your personal safety become very motivating. And so because of those two factors, they adapted very quickly. And they were, you know, wanting wanting to know quickly how we could transition them to virtual care. So it was probably a little bit of a gift in that regard, if we can say anything that came out of the pandemic is a gift because it accelerated change across our organization in an unprecedented way. And so we really didn't have any resistance because people were so concerned about their own personal safety, but also concerned about their ability to continue to care for patients. I will say that one of the biggest challenges we had was, and I alluded to this earlier, was just sorting through the technology, who had what technology, who needed what piece of technology to accomplish a virtual visit, and then the payer rules around who would reimburse for telephonic, who would reimburse for a video visit, and then billing codes, because if you use the wrong billing code, you can short yourself tremendously from the reimbursement and RVU value. And so just sorting, that's been a real learning experience for us and a learning experience for our physicians and APPs as well. But our teams have adapted quickly. Interestingly enough, our, our patients have also adapted very quickly. Their main concern that we heard over and over was, are you going to be there for me? Are you going to be open? Am I going to be able to have my appointment? And they would call our call center often and say, are, you guys aren't closing, are you? You're going to be open. I can have my appointment, right? My provider's going to be available to me. Because what we saw in the early days of the pandemic was around us community mental health centers and private um, private programs closed down, just closed overnight, and patients panicked. And so they were very happy to hear that in, in, in some shape or form we would be available to them. So we really, I, as I said, we never really slowed down. We had a one-week one week transition in volume. So for one week we slowed down in our visit volume, and within that about 14 days, we were back to pre-COVID volumes on visit volume, and now are higher than before the pandemic, higher volume than before the pandemic. So I think that speaks to patient uptake. We also had this incredible gift of transitioning to a really great patient experience platform called Medalia during the, um, just right at the outset of the pandemic. And we get almost immediate patient feedback when they fill out the survey. And so we had this instant feedback loop from our patients. So early on when we first transitioned to the virtual visits, we got a lot of feedback from patients about they were frustrated, they didn't understand how to log on, they didn't know how to get on the platform. And so we quickly created a set of instructions that every patient received that walked them through it step by step, um, even with pictures. And they get that before their appointment time to help them log on. And our teams became very adept at answering calls and helping patients walk through the process. But overall, our patients were just grateful that they could still have their appointment. And many times when I'm reading the comments, patients remark about how they feel safe. So they're grateful they can still have their appointment and they grat they're grateful that they feel safe because they're frightened to come into a healthcare environment during this time. Martha, I can echo it, um, that because I have a family member who's been receiving care virtually and has um, really ease the anxiety, not only um, for my family member, but also um, ease their anxiety about perhaps going to a place where they might bring COVID back home um, to myself or someone else in our family. So it is so 
critically important. Um, you mentioned a number of things that are related to um, starting to quantify the impact of this, whether it's the instant feedback loop um, or the fact that, you know, you took a week off, paused, and then came back, and now you're back up to um, normal volumes. Are there other data that you'd like to share um, with the listeners about um, the usage and the outcomes of, of, you know, having such a robust virtual platform, including telebehavioral health? You know, it's early to have um, really strong quantifiable clinical outcomes, and I think that's something I want to talk about a little later in the podcast. But one of the most remarkable things that we have seen other than just the visit volume, which means we're not losing patients, we're keeping patients engaged in care, they're keeping their appointments. Our no-show rate historically has been about 20%. Uh, that's a variety of reasons, obviously. Um, some of it is, you know, delay till they could get an appointment. Some of it is transportation. Some of it is life happens and you can't get there that day. But since we transitioned to the virtual care platform, our no-show rate has declined to below 10%. And that is almost overnight. Wow. And so the, the win for me is that when we talk about access to care, this is a game changer. This is a way that patients can access care that fits in with their life or their, or their social status or their ability to secure transportation or leave their home. It's just, it's, it's just absolutely been amazing and really was an unanticipated outcome of this whole process. I do think the quantifiable data on patient experience is really important. I just looked at our score for our outpatient settings about five minutes ago, and um, it's at 94% of our patients rate us either a 9 or a 10 um, for, their, for their visit. So I think we have very good data that patients are having a great experience regardless of the way that we are connecting with them. One of the other things that is, this is clearly um, not quantifiable, it's clearly um, subjective, but it was fascinating to me as I'd done virtual huddles with all of our teams to hear in the voices and the comments of our caregivers their desire to make sure patients get the services that they need. And our ACT teams, you know, go into the home actually and see the patients. So that's a face-to-face -face encounter in a very environment in an environment with um, where, where our providers have very little control over the environment that they're seeing the patient in and so now we're having to learn how to navigate in a world where this clearly isn't ending soon and how do we make sure that we keep our teammates safe yet still deliver care in those environments it's been pretty remarkable that our inpatient units have remained at 98 percent occupancy we've done that throughout the entire pandemic we never had a slowdown uh, we've kept our beds completely full and managed to navigate with full hospitals um, through the pandemic, which I think is testimony to all the work we did around keeping patients safe and screening appropriately and, and implementing um, testing and those kind of activities. And one of the most exciting things that we're going to do as a result of this, I mean, I always like to look at these opportunities and think, what can this teach us about how we deliver care? And one of the things that we know nationally about behavioral health is that there is a very high readmission rate and a higher rate of readmission likelihood if a patient does not keep their hospital follow-up appointment. And hospital follow-up appointments are hard for patients because they've just been at the hospital. They really don't want to come back. So often they're tempted to skip that hospital follow-up. So we thought about how could we leverage the learning we've had on virtual care delivery and keeping patients engaged in care and our ability to use a virtual care platform. And so we just applied for a grant to, and also our virtual hospital for COVID patients um, for the system, we just applied for a grant for a virtual psychiatric transition hospital. And our vision is that we would connect with every patient who's discharged from an inpatient unit and they would complete their hospital follow-up virtually versus having to come back to a face-to-face -face visit for that hospital follow-up. And then we would follow that patient for somewhere around 45 days until we're sure that they're engaged with the next provider. And so hopefully keeping patients engaged, not only engaged in treatment, but preventing those readmissions within 30 days and that cyclical nature of illness um, around mental illness. 
So stay tuned. That's phenomenal. Not only are you innovating, um, or as they say, um, building the plane while you're flying it, um, but you're now navigating to a new location <laughs> while you're building the plane and flying it at the same time. That's, that's really exceptional. Um, I just want to take just a moment here to let you know that um, you, you've expressed several times the value, um, uh, not only in the current situation, but obviously moving forward in um, the role that telemedicine can play, the role that virtual platforms, virtual delivery of care can play in improving access, in reducing readmissions, um, and hopefully we will see also in the quality of care um, in many different ways can add. And so I just want to let all listening know that AHA has um, created a list of the legislative and regulatory um, waivers um, uh, and the flexibilities that have been provided during this pandemic emergency. Um, and we are working hard with both the administration and with Congress to try to make most of those all that we can um, uh, possibly be permanent. So um, more to come on that as well. So as we begin, unfortunately, to get towards the end of this wonderful interview, um, could you share some concrete steps and tips you can offer to other hospitals and health systems that may want to try to build out their virtual health programs? Yeah, that, that's a great thought going forward because we certainly have a lot of lessons learned, Rebecca. And I'm going to give you a list, but I'm, they're not necessarily in any kind of priority order. They're just the things you have to keep in mind when you're trying to build this program out. And the first thing, obviously, is equipment. I think it's clear from my comments earlier that you have to have the right equipment. You can't send somebody home with a laptop that doesn't have a microphone or a camera. You can't send somebody home with a you know camera that doesn't work. So though all those things have to be working for your providers to adapt quickly and for your patients to adapt quickly have to agree on a platform obviously it has to be HIPAA compliant you have to you know people quickly want to navigate to things like um, you know Facebook or zoom but those are you know not always HIPAA protected so we still have to care about our patients privacy and we have to make sure that the platform we're using is um, HIPAA compliant and is secure and it's really easy for our patients to access you need to create very structured processes. In the beginning, with everything that we navigated through, and this is we've only touched the very surface of that, my team would come to me with an idea, and I'm like, okay, that's a great idea. Now go back and tell me step one, step two, step three, step four, so that if I'm a teammate and I'm trying to do this, I know exactly what to do next if this happens. So take the, you know, it's that old adage of go slow to go fast. Take the time to create a structured process so that everyone is doing it the same way. Your patients are, are guaranteed a similar experience of care. Your providers are secure that they're supported in the care delivery model and make sure that we have some consistency in how we deliver care. The fourth thing is making sure that you have someone on your team who really understands finance and understands the billing code implications and the payer rules. Because as you talked about, you published all the waivers on the AHA website, but they're all different. Every payer has a different set of rules and a different way that they're approaching this. And so you have to have somebody that's attentive to each payer, knows when what they're covering, what they're not covering, knows how you have to bill it in order to get the appropriate reimbursement. And then you have to way, have a way to follow your patient's experience of care, you know, quickly. How are your patients doing? How are they adapting? Are the platforms working for them? Are they canceling visits, et cetera? And then finally, you have to have an eye to physician productivity because there's a, when you send someone home to work or provider productivity, I should say physician or APP, when you send some home to work, all bets are off. You have no real window into their work day unless you are monitoring and, and then understanding if they're not meeting their productivity targets, what are the barriers to that and how can you help them. But make sure that you're closely monitoring that um, as you implement. And I think those are the most important steps to go through relative to standing up a program. Well, I want to call out and, and first of all echo everything that you said. Um, just add a couple of things. Um, earlier on in the podcast, you mentioned the fact that, you know, 
phone, speaking to someone over the phone um, is a virtual communication. And for the longest time, Medicare would not reimburse for um, phone counseling. Um, and so there has been some flexibility that's been, been built in there. We also know that um, there are certain individuals who just don't have a smartphone. Um, so they don't have the video capability or they don't have a computer, to your point about technology, making sure that, that they even have access through that way. So that's one of the areas that we're continuing to work on. Your comments about privacy are so spot on, but I'd add and layer over that cybersecurity concerns. Um, because it sounds like you took the time, um, wisely so, to really make sure that not only was the privacy in place, privacy protections in place, but also that you um, are working with platforms that minimize um, the possibility of a successful cyber attack. Um, the third thing I'd echo in what you said is you've got to plan the work and work the plan. When you said to your staff, go back and, you know, tell me what step one is, step two is, you know, plan the work and work the plan. Whatever gets measured gets managed. And um, that is so incredibly important. And then I just want to let everyone know, to your point about, um, you know, making sure someone's watching the finances, obviously, always. Um, AHA has um, a uh, billing coding clinic staff. So if there are questions about that, um, either now or in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I think I'm going to, um, uh, you know, you, you've mentioned what you think uh, the future of virtual behavioral health care looks like um, via your grant, um, but is there anything else you'd like to say about virtual behavioral health care um, in today's COVID-19 environment or in the future? Last words yeah. of wisdom. Yes. Um, you know, obviously what happens in the future is largely dependent on payers. Um, there's clear, clear, clear evidence that patient access is improved in, with our ability to add this as a care delivery model. But if parity does not persist, if that all gets rolled back, then we will be forced to go back to face-to-face -to -face care because we won't be able to afford to deliver care that we're not being reimbursed for. So we're, you know, the work that AHA is doing around helping us drive the right decisions in the payer world is really important work. I do think it's clear that there's going to be high consumer demand. We've given them a taste of what this is like, and they like it. And so I think that will um, drive some pressure on the payers to, to not just roll everything back 100%. Um, as we plan for reentry and we do have some face-to-face -face visits, we've had to really think through what do our waiting rooms look like? How do patients come through the door? How do we screen them? Do they have to wear a mask? Those sort of things that we have a responsibility to work through as we plan reentry. But I also want to say, finally, that as providers, we have a lot of responsibility here for how this goes. And we have to be able to demonstrate to payers that we are driving similar outcomes using a telebehavioral health that we would drive using face-to-face -face care. There is a lot of data out there, probably well over 100 published studies around video visits and video virtual care. There are very few around telephonic e-visits. And so one of the things that we're struggling with with our clinical team is how many telephonic e-visits in a row are safe until you need to see the patient face-to-face -face or you need to have a video visit. How many should you be able to do an initial evaluation on a telephonic visit where you can't really see the patient's affect or understand how the patient's responding to you? We, we are sorting through that and working through it as a system. I think it always creates opportunities for research and how do we um, demonstrate that, that we are making good clinical decisions around the use of telephonic e-visits, particularly when they're being used for diagnostic purposes for, um, and for treatment purposes around medication dosing. And then I think that um, the other area that we're really struggling with, if there's even a good way to do it on a telebehavioral health platform, is psych evals that our psychologists um, that our psychologists perform psychological testing. That is really difficult to do on a telebehavioral health platform, and so we're really trying to figure out 
how will we do psychological testing in this new world and do it safely. So I think that we've been presented with this huge opportunity. We're going to be managing in a world with COVID in it. It's like we've been handed a gift, and it's important that we respond as behavioral health across this country with a really clear vision around tracking outcomes and also just completely embracing transformation and innovation at every turn in every ability with, with a clear eye to the goal is to keep the patient engaged in treatment and making sure that we have access to care. The final thing I'll say, Rebecca, is that this new world, at least for us, has created a new level of partnership that really is unprecedented. We are on calls with people that we never never met that worked in our organization. We are working on teams and solving problems in the moment with a whole new level of cooperation and a whole new level of interest in getting the problem solved and working together. And I never want to lose that, pandemic or not. I don't want that to change. We've, we are out of our silos. We are working as a group. We're doing incident command. We're making decisions quickly. We're testing and trying new things rapidly. And it's been a great world in that respect. And I don't want to lose what we've learned in that regard. Martha, a couple of times you've referenced this as a gift, as an opportunity. Um, sometimes I've framed it as a sliver of a silver lining in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the partnerships that have opened up, the opportunities, the acceleration of the use of digital solutions to improve access to care. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, I think, or perhaps I hope, that um, this um, uh, understanding this um, collaboration that's happening in organizations across the country, clearly at a significantly um, higher rate, um, a, as you describe it at Atrium, but um, that, that out of this will come a reduction in stigma around seeking help for psychiatric and substance use disorders, that um, will be able to move that needle on reducing the stigma and improving access to care, as you've described here. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to share your innovation, your wisdom, your experiences. I think, unfortunately, this wraps up this podcast. I want to thank all of you who were listening to this. Um, I want to encourage you to go to the website for AHA Center for Health Innovation. That's aha.org forward slash center. And also, um, uh, we, there's a variety of resources um, related to behavioral health care providers um, at aha.org forward slash behavioral health. That's where you can also click on the resource that I mentioned earlier related to um, resources that can help you with um, stress and coping during COVID-19 time of stress. Martha, it has been my honor to uh, get to talk to you today. I thank you so very much. Um, and keep up the great work, and um, you certainly are a leader advancing behavioral health care in this country. Thank you. Thank you.